All right, before we get into the actual stuff up here, um, I want to talk a little bit about science in general as a process. It's something that is commonly uh, misunderstood. So, what does it mean to take a scientific approach to knowledge? What does that mean to you? Quantitative analysis. What? Quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis, so things that are, that you have to quanti quantify something with numbers. That may be part of it. There's, I think, some broader definitions there as well. Anybody else? What do you think of when you think of scientific knowledge? What does that mean for knowledge to be scientific? Able to test it. Able to test it, sure. That's, that's something that's big. Test it, reproduce it. What else? Like scientific method. Apply the scientific method, yeah, which is you can form these uh, hypothesis, hypotheses that are testable, um, that sort of thing. That's certainly a main part of it. What is um, sort of shocking and scary about the scientific approach to knowledge? Why is it that scientists were excommunicated or killed because of science? What is what is what makes people uncomfortable about science? What is it about science that is frightening to some people? Just you get the same results. What? You get the same results. So you get the same results all the time. Yeah, I mean, that, I can see how that would be frightening. It challenges preconceived notions. It challenges preconceived notions. And that's really the main, um, the main idea of the scientific approach to knowledge. Hey. And the main point of the scientific approach to knowledge is it begins with something called the null hypothesis. When you do science, you're supposed to stay, say at the beginning, I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know how this works. I have no idea. I know nothing. That's the null hypothesis. Then you propose some testable questions, you test those things, and you draw some inferences from the results that you get, and that's how you build your knowledge. Now that's really frightening to people in positions of power, let's say, because historically people in positions of power get to decide what the knowledge is. I mean, we're talking a long time ago, the king would decide why the sun shines, and everybody would believe that's why the sun shines, you know? Or whoever, you know, uh, the pope or, or anybody who was in power got to decide why things were the way they were. And science would say, no, you don't get to decide. Nobody decides. We know nothing until we actually test it out and come to some uh, conclusions that are verifiable, that are repeatable, and that are uh, accepted overall. So that said, what is the difference between a scientific law and a scientific theory? The law is proven and it's universal. A theory is something that you have to test and it could be possible. possible. Okay, did everybody hear that? So that is the common, I'm sorry, misconception of what a scientific law and a scientific theory are. I, I mean, I don't mean to like put you down on that. That's what everyone thinks that they are. And, um, and that's actually incorrect. Both a scientific law and a scientific theory must be constantly tested and can be revised if they're found to be no longer correct. There's actually a more um, technical, small difference between them. A scientific law describes a series of observations, things that happen. This stuff happens. It happens all the time. We call it a law. Uh, that's why we have something like the law of gravity. Gravity has happened every time someone has tested it. Right? You see things falling to the ground, you measure their speed, you can always verify that that's happening. A theory is the reason behind why something happens. And it is just as susceptible to testing, to being right and to being wrong, as a law. So the law describes what's happening, and the theory describes why. We actually don't really have a good theory of gravity yet. Um, we don't know why the bodies attract each other in the way that they do. So we have, so uh, that's the one thing I want you to take away from this, is that a law is not better than a theory. It's not more proven than a theory. It's not more um, true than a theory. They're both the same in that regard. A law describes what happens. It describes a set of observations. And a theory describes why that, those things happen. And so it's kind of the reason behind that. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about that as we go through with some more concrete examples. But well, the other part that is both dangerous and interesting and fun and good about science is the idea of uncertainty. Again, going back to 
the kings and whoever else deciding what's true and what's false, there's no room for uncertainty there. This person decides what's true, you believe it, done. Right? Science says, not only is that not the case, because we're going to start from the null hypothesis, but even when we actually figure something out, we're still not going to believe it to completely 100% exclude any other uh, ex ex excuse me, to exclude any other explanations. So uh, this is true with something as small as a measurement, and it's true as something as big as a theory or a law, that when we come up with something, we always leave room for uncertainty. We leave room for the fact that we didn't exactly get this 100% perfectly right because it's never possible to get something exactly 100% perfectly right, as you'll find out at the first exam. Um, no, that was a joke. Yeah. I'm sure you'll all get 100% on the first exam. So, uh, so let's talk about it in measurement because this is going to be the most useful form of uncertainty. The bigger ideas of uncertainty in, involving uh, theories and explanations, you know, we'll keep that in the backs of our heads. But as far as practice in the lab, what does this look like? When you take a measurement, we're going to take lots of measurements, right? graduated cylinders, beakers, burettes, pipettes, balance, whatever. There are always going to be certain digits and uncertain digits. And I know you've all learned about significant figures in the past, but you may not have learned about it in this particular way. Okay. The whole point of significant figures, at least, I don't know, maybe you did, you probably had better teachers. When I learned about significant figures, it was sort of like, here are the rules for significant figures. And this is just what you do. Done. Nobody ever told me where a significant figure comes from. Why, is it, why does this measurement have four significant figures, but this measurement only has two? What does that even mean? Well, this is what it means. There is always one uncertain digit in a measurement. Just one. And it is the rightmost number in a recorded number. We'll write that down here. Okay. And that's what a significant figure means. If your if your number is 1.234, that means that the one is certain, the two is certain, and the three is certain, and the four is estimated. And that's why you have four significant figures. Those four are significant. So let's look at these measurements. I don't know if you can see it up there. Probably you can. In this graduated cylinder on the right, we're measuring the liquid at this point right here. Okay. So what digits are certain? What is it at least definitely bigger than? 70, right. It's definitely bigger than 70. Definitely between 70 and 80. What else is certain? I would say, you may not be able to see it from there, but it's definitely above that third line. So that means it's, it's at least what? 73. 73. So do we take this measurement as 73 milliliters? What do we take it as? 73.0. 73 point something. The last one is an estimated digit. So, uh, you know, you're looking at it. It's definitely less than halfway between those two lines. Um, I'm going to say 73.2. And it's an estimate. I know it's not 73.5. It seems closer, like 2. Generally, the idea is that that, uh, that uncertainty is within approximately plus or minus 1, sometimes plus or minus 2. And then those three digits are all significant. All right? OK, let's try the next one. What is that temperature at least greater than? Certainly greater than 80, certainly greater than 85. And yeah, it seems to be going a little past 88. And how do we record that? As 88 or with one more digit? One more. But I'm, you know, I'm going to say 88.2 or 3 or something like that. Now, whenever you take a measurement, whether it's a volume or a mass or whatever, this is what I want you to do. You go all the certain digits, and then one more that you estimate. On a digital balance, it sort of does that for you. The last digit on the digital balance is actually uh, uncertain. All right, and then finally this one. Now the scale's a little bit different. What is it definitely bigger than? 
definitely bigger than 600, and I would say you might not be able to see it, but bigger than 640 as well. So what do we call this? Yeah, 645. Okay. And again, all three of those digits are certain or are significant. Two are certain, one is uncertain. So those are the significant figures. And generally, that uncertainty should be plus or minus one unless otherwise noted. In some cases, you can't estimate that small, so it will be plus or minus five. Can it ever be plus or minus 10? Why? Yeah, because if it were plus or minus 10, that's like saying that the next digit is uncertain. So you should have just said that that digit was uncertain. All right. A couple more terms we're going to talk about. Precision and accuracy are two terms that are pretty much used interchangeably for much of the population. When we're talking about science, when we're talking about measurement, those actually mean different things. So one of them means the agreement of a given value to the true value. And one of them is the degree of agreement among several measurements. So the reproducibility. Which one's which? Anybody know? The first one's accuracy. The second one's preci precision. That's correct. And this is really only in apl in, as applied to measurements. I mean, if you say something that's right, and I say precisely, that I could have also said, that's accurate. We, you know, we use those things interchangeably in everyday conversation. When we talk about a measurement, this is what we're talking about. So let's look at these three different sets of data and decide how to describe them. Um, so actually, let's start all the way over at student C. Student C takes four data points and gets uh, 10.03, 9.99, 10.03, 9.98 uh, grams for a measurement. Is that measurement accurate, assuming that the true mass is 10? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. Is it precise? Yeah. It is precise. So we would say that student C is both accurate and precise. What would you say about student B? Precise, but not accurate. Student B is precise. The measurements are very produ reproducible, but not, not accurate because the average was down at 9 point something. And then what about student A? Neither. You might say that student A is sort of accurate. It's close. The average is actually fairly close, but certainly not precise. So what do you think? Would you say that's, I guess if we're saying this isn't accurate, we should say this isn't accurate either because it's This gets to two different types of errors. I don't think I actually have these written down. Let's put it over on the side here. You can have systematic error, and you can have random error. Systematic error means that your data will be precise but not accurate. It means that something is affecting every one of your measurements. And even though all your measurements are good, you know, you're doing them reproducibly, something is setting them all off a little bit. An example of a systematic error is an uncalibrated balance, a balance in the lab that's always off by a gram. You can get very precise data, but it's not going to be accurate because it's, everything's off a gram. Random errors are, let's say you have, um, let's say your balance is very susceptible to wind, and it's very windy in the lab. So some measurements are going to be pushed down by the wind, some are not. They're going to be kind of all over the place. A random error should average out over time. If you do enough measurements, you'll be, you'll be accurate with random error. 
because all the errors would cancel each other out because they're random. But you won't be precise because you're always getting this random error one way or the other. So that's how uh, accuracy and precision relate also to errors. All right, let's look at some significant figures. I know you've done this before. I don't want to bore you, but we need to be all be on the same page with this, so we'll go through it very quickly. How many significant figures here? Four. All digits are significant. How about here? Three. These three are significant. So what this tells you, say this is a measurement, that tells you that this measurement was between 0 0.0540 and 0. Point, whoops, I'm sorry, 0 0.539 and 0 0.0541 because that last digit is uncertain within plus or minus one. That's what that uncertainty means. So those first zeros aren't counted because they just tell you where, it, where the number is in dimension. It means you're measuring something fairly small. It doesn't tell you how precisely or accurately you're measuring it. It just tells you it's very small. Yeah. That's right, because let's compare that. So what's the difference between 0 0.0540 and 0 0.054? Thinking in the uncertainty range, 0 0.054 is going to be between, those are the significant figures, that's going to be between 0 0.053 and 0 0.055. So, yeah. No, in a decimal it's not. Now let's look at it the other way. Let's look at it for a non-decimal number. Do you have a question too? Yeah, I was like, I would say like, um, I like to think of this with like anything left or right off the um, decimal point. It's important. Okay. So if you have numbers, yeah. Then anything like if you're on the right side. Anything after is the important on the right side. On the left side, anything before is important. Yeah, that's one way to think about it. I think it's easier to just do this in your head and see what if it, if it makes a difference. Right? If is 0 0.540 is between those two very small, and 0.54 is between those two, which is quite a bit bigger. So you know that last one must be significant. And um, so then in another example, Let's say 12,500. This is actually a little bit ambiguous. It could be between 12,499 and 12,501, in which case those zeros are significant. Or maybe those zeros aren't significant, and it's between uh, 12,400 and 12,600. That's a big difference. We need to figure that out. All right, so that's ambiguous. So is this our range, 12,499 to 12,501, or 12,400 to 12,600? Depending on whether those last two zeros are significant, that's going to make a big difference. Or what if only the first four digits, that, that middle zero, are significant, but the last zero isn't? Again, there's no way to really show that here. So what do we do instead? What's a better way to express this number if we care about being clear about significant figures? Scientific, scientific notation. Okay, scientific notation. So if we express this number as 12.5, whoops, I'm sorry, 1.25 times 10 to the fourth, 
That's very clear and unambiguous that we are talking about this. That last digit is, is uncertain. So we're between 12,400 or 12,600. If we express it as 1.2500 times 10 to the fourth, then we are clearly and unambiguously talking about this. And if we express it as 1.25, whoops, 1.250 times 10 to the fourth, we are clearly talking about the range of 12,490 to 12,510. So two, three different possible ranges of uncertainty that we need to communicate clearly. And doing it that way over on the left is not communicating it clearly. There is a shorthand, though, that we can use sometimes where you put a decimal at the end, so 12,500 dot. And that signifies that all those digits should be significant. So sometimes that's used. I think your book uses that sometimes. A scientific notation is certainly the clearest. And if we're not using scientific notation, it's either because we don't really care that about, about significant figures that much for this problem, or um, we weren't thinking about it, or it's very clear which digits are significant and which aren't. So any questions about that? OK. Let's talk about how to do math with them. If you multiply or divide, you, the result carries the same number of significant figures as the factor with the fewest, which means from a chemistry standpoint, from a measurement standpoint, whatever your least certain, whatever your least accurate measurement or least precise measurement is, that's what controls your overall uncertainty uh, in a process like this, which makes sense, right? If you have a balance that you measure out to four or to six significant figures and you have a volume that you measure out to four significant figures, but then you're basically guessing on some other thing that's only two significant figures, that becomes the limitation of your accuracy or of your precision. So you have to go with that one. As an example, we take 1.5, whoops, because I happen to have these numbers around. 1.052 times 12.054 times 0 0.53. And if I put all those in my calculator, I get 6.7208. How should I report that number? Do you have a question? Well, yeah, that's, that's why it's ambiguous. So we don't know. If, you mean if we draw the period behind it? Or if we just draw it like this? If we just write it like this, we don't know, really. We can say three, maybe. F three for sure, but we don't really know. So if you really want to communicate that clearly, you want to use one of the scientific notation methods. So how should we report this number? 6.7. 6.7. This number has four significant figures. This number has five. And this number has just two. So we need to report this number as 6.7. That's the limit of our certainty. That means that whatever we did this math on, whatever we were trying to figure out, that quantity is somewhere between 6.6 .6 and 6.8. And that's the best we can say. Addition and subtraction is a little bit different because you don't have the chance of just changing the number of decimal places. So it works with, with the decimal places rather than with the numbers of significant figures. It looks like this. You line up all your 
numbers that you're trying to add. So 2 point or subtract 2.345, 0 0.07. And you make sure the, the decimal places all line up. And you add them all up, you get 5.4125. And then you cut it off at whatever the actual furthest decimal place you have is. So the furthest decimal place is the 7, 0.07 in the hundredths. So that means we're going to cut everything off at the hundredths, or after the hundredths. And so this number should be reported as 5.41. Now the reason we do that Yes, this only has one significant figure, but that significant figure is the plus or minus one in the hundredths place. So that's still where the uncertainty is. The uncertainty is in the hundredths place. And that's why we do it this way um, for uh, addition and subtraction. Right. Questions about those? There are some practice problems in the book um, as part of chapter one. Just you may want to brush up on some of this. It's been a while since you thought about it. All right, same deal. Well, not same deal. Let's talk about rounding. What happens when you have to do this? In a series of calculations, carry the extra digits through the final, then round. So you don't worry about cutting down to the appropriate number of significant figures until the end of your calculations. You can use all the other stuff throughout, and then you cut it down. And then if the digit to, remove, to be removed is less than 5, you just truncate, meaning you cut the rest off and the preceding digit stays the same. Example, 15.22 rounds to 15.2. So we just cut that off. Equal to or greater than 5, the preceding digit is increased by 1. So 121.45 is 121.5. Okay? So that, that's the proper scientific measurement way to round things. Sometimes it seems like 5 kind of goes back and forth. Some people like to truncate the 5. Some people like to round the 5 up. The convention is um, in science that we round the 5 up. So we'll do that in this class. All right, now on to the fun. Let's actually do some of these calculations we've been so excitedly talking about. One thing I, I asked you to review, those of you who talked to me uh, on Monday, is dimensional analysis. This is something that you definitely have to know how to do uh, in this class. And I'm going to kind of, we're going to go over it now. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. I'm going to more or less assume that you sort of have done this before and you kind of know what you're doing. If that's not the case, that's fine. This is not a super hard thing. Just make sure you take a little time um, to practice it. All right. Unit factors. A unit factor is when you find a way to, equip, to equate one of something with a certain number of something else. It is the same type of measurement. For instance, there are 16 ounces in one pound, or one pound in 16 ounces. That's a unit factor. One inch to 2.54 centimeters. 2.54 centimeters per one inch. All right. These factors do not change the number, only the unit. Make sense? So they don't change what the actual measurement is from a certain or uncertain standpoint. They only change the unit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, about what that means in terms of significant figures with conversions in a second. But let's do a couple of these. All right. Here are the basic steps. Let's do one. I'm not going to go through the steps. We'll just do it. How many miles would you walk if you had to walk 10.0 kilometers? Those of you who are runners and such probably already know. But uh, let's go through the calculation. You need to know a kilometer is 1,000 meters, a meter is 100 centimeters, an inch is 2.54 centimeters, etc. OK, now what do you need to know from a knowledge for this class standpoint? 
you should know how to work the metric system. You should know how many centimeters are in a meter. You should know how many kilometers are in a meter. You should know how many millimeters are in. You should know all that stuff. Okay, that should be in your head. Good. Um, get it in your head if it's not. You don't need to know these other specific numbers. You don't need to be able to tell me that an inch is 2.54 centimeters or that a mile is 5,280 feet. You don't need those conversion factors. If you need to do those on quizzes and tests, I'll always give those numbers to you. But you do need to know the, um, the metric system, the different, the different prefixes. So let's do the problem. Now people have different methods of doing these types of problems. And if your method that you learned in kindergarten or whenever is, uh, is successful for you, then continue to use it. If it's not, you never really got it, here's another one you can try. So this is how I usually do it. You start with what you're starting with, and then each step you want to change the unit into something that brings you closer to what you ultimately want it to be. So I'm going to multiply this by the unit factor of 1,000 meters per one kilometer. Now, why did I do it that way? Why didn't I put one kilometer per 1,000 meters? That's right. So this way they'll cancel out. I cancel kilometers and kilometers, and now I have meters. Now I want to cancel meters. So I'm going to put 100 centimeters per meter. Now, of course, you could find other unit factors that would make this a whole lot easier. You could just find how many um, miles are in a kilometer. But we're going to do it the long way just as an exercise right now. So 100 centimeters per one meter, my meters go away. Now I'm at centimeters, so I'm going to convert centimeters to inches. One inch per 2.54 centimeters. Centimeters go away. And now I'm going to take 12 inches, whoops. One foot per 12 inches. And now I've got to change lines here. So inches go away. And then I'm going to make feet go away with the miles. One mile, 5280 feet. Add all that up together, 6.21 miles in 10 kilometers. So you're going to multiply that together and that's what you get. Okay. So what about significant figures here? Why did I report this as three significant figures? Because like 12 inches in one foot, isn't that like one or two significant figures? What's going on here? Yeah, so I started with three significant figures. That's right. Did my measurement, but, but, but in the multiplication, did I ever multiply by something with fewer than three significant figures? No. Yeah. Yes. How do we answer that? What do we, what do we say? Uh, yes, yes. Why? Because that tells us that the measurement is between like 10.0 is between 9.9 .9 and 10.1. If it were just 10, it would be between 9 and 11. That's right. That's right. But one thing you have to, yes. One thing you have to be careful of when doing these conversions is that <coughs> some unit factors are exact and others are estimated. For instance, 12 inches in a foot. Is that an exact measurement or is that an estimation? It's exact. There are exactly 12 inches in a foot by definition. What about uh, 1,000 meters in a kilometer? Is that exact or is that an uh, um, estimate? Exact. By definition, that's what a kilometer is. It's 1,000 meters exactly. 
Well, what about 2.54 centimeters in an inch? That's not exact. That's not exact. There are 2.54 something, 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 something centimeters in an inch. I don't know what those other numbers are. But there's, you know, a bunch. Now, that number is known out to many decimal places. But it's not exact. So you have to make sure to use at least as many decimal places, at least as many significant figures in that conversion as you started with. And that's what we did here. So the only inexact one is the conversion from centimeters to inches. So the conversion from two different measurement systems. And that one we pick 2.54 to be the same number of significant figures as what we started with so that there isn't an effect there. If instead we had used 2.5 centimeters for, in, for an inch, then we would need to revise our reported number at the end to 6.2 instead of 6.21 because that would cut down the certainty. All right? you, so usually, generally when you're doing these things, if you're staying within the same system, um, then everything's pretty much exact. But if you're switching from English to metric or metric to English, that's when things uh, usually so mess what, up. So what determines when you use 2.54 or 2.5 the amount of significant figures in the conversion? Right, the amount that you want. So let's say my initial measurement is 10.0. If I want to do a conversion, I don't want to lose a significant figure because I worked hard at getting that extra precision, right? So. Um, I want to pick my conversion to make sure I retain that. So if you had like five significant figures for the original crop, would you do like 2.54? Right, I'd want to look up those additional two significant figures so I wasn't damaging my measurement by, by doing the conversion. Yeah. So sorry to get that? Yeah. No. No. I will give you like the estimate conversions. But you should know all the metric conversions. Yeah. And you should know this one. Temperature. You should know how to convert from temperature. There are three commonly used scales. We've, I, you've probably heard of all of these. We will pretty much exclusively be dealing with Kelvin and Celsius in this class. Um, Fahrenheit is the more common way that they read the weather around here, but it's really not a great measurement system. Um, and so we're going to learn how to convert back and forth among all of these to make sure that we understand. All right, one little, one little extra thing. Celsius and Fahrenheit are the names of a scale. And then the temperature is reported as degrees on that scale. Kelvin is a unit. So you actually say, like, 298 Kelvin is actually 298 Kelvins. It's, it's just a unit, like millimeter or meter or whatever else, or gram. So we don't say degrees Kelvin. We just say Kelvin or Kelvin. OK, the easy ones, and this number you do definitely have to know, is converting between Kelvin and Celsius. Kelvin is uh, Kelvin is the same scale as Celsius, but offset by 273.15 degrees. And that's the distance between absolute zero and the temperature at which water freezes. So Celsius begins zero at water freezing. Kelvin begins zero at absolute zero. All right, now let's actually try to figure out how we can determine the relationship between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now you should eventually just know the equation, but it's good to know how, where it comes from as well. So we're going to look at water as the standard and relate these two scales. The boiling point of water in Fahrenheit is 212 degrees F. Celsius is 100. Freezing point is 32 F and freezing point of water at Celsius is zero. So let's show those two scales. If we talk about the behavior of liquid water, we're going from 32 degrees F to 212 degrees F. And if we're talking about 
Celsius, we're going from 0 to 100. So how many degrees Fahrenheit are between those, the freezing point and the boiling point of water? Hmm? 180. So this is, this span is 180 degrees. And of course this one is 100 degrees. So what's larger, a degree Fahrenheit or a degree in Celsius? Celsius. So this allows us to make a couple relationships based on a ratio. We can say that there are 180 degrees Fahrenheit per every 100 degrees Celsius. So then how much bigger is a Celsius degree than a Fahrenheit degree? Yeah, it's about 1.8 or you know, almost 2. And in fact, if you reduce this down, the best fraction you can get is 9 degrees F for every 5 degrees C. Right? Make sense so far? So that means that a Celsius degree is 9 fifths bigger than a Fahrenheit degree. OK. So without looking at the equations down here, before we go to that, you all just, just looked at me. Don't look at me. If you have a Fahrenheit degree and you want to turn it into a Celsius degree, do you multiply it by 9 fifths or 5 ninths? You want to turn Fahrenheit into Celsius, do you multiply by 9 fifths or 5 ninths? Let's talk about it. So degree F goes to degree C. Are we going to multiply this by 9 fifths or 5 ninths? Well, OK, let's think about it this way. Is a Celsius degree bigger or smaller than a Fahrenheit degree? Bigger. So is it going to get better? Is it going to get bigger if we multiply it by 9 fifths or by 5 ninths? 9 fifths. Right. So that's the way to go. And the reason, the reason I did it that way is, is sort of a thought thing. Because I wanted you to think about that it's very simple. Are we just making this bigger or are we making it sm smaller? Because the thing that I always forget in this, in doing these conversions, I always forget whether it's 9 fifths or 5 ninths for each one. So that's how I remember it. I actually, I don't remember it. I have to figure it out every time I think about it. Um, that the, the Fahrenheit degree has to be bigger to be a Celsius degree. So we must have to go by 9 fifths rather than, and then the other direction would be 5 ninths. And then the last part of the conversion is a correction for the zero point. So remember our scales up here. The zero F is back here. So even if we standardize the degrees with the 9 fifths or 5 ninths, we still have to move everything back. So our final equation comes out to something like this. And let's, uh, let's plug this in and give it a try. Normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees F. What is this temperature expressed in Kelvin? So to do this in Kelvin, we first have to convert it to uh, Celsius, and then then we can move it over. So why don't you try these couple? Do you guys have phones or calculators or something? And see what you come up with. Okay, I think I got this backwards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thought is right that yes, a, a degree C is lar must necessarily be larger than a degree F. But the effect of that is that the actual temperature ends up being smaller. And the way you can think about that, of course, is just from comparing the, the boiling points. If you know that the Fahrenheit is always going to be higher in temperature, um, we're not actually changing the value of one degree by doing this conversion. So. Um, 
from a math standpoint, I, I kind of explained it backwards, so I'm sorry. You would actually multiply the degrees f by 5 ninths because cel the temperature in degrees Celsius will always be less. The degree itself will be larger, but the temperature will be lower because of that. So I, I know that just confused you more. So you plug these things into the equation. What do you get for the first one? Right, so this should be properly uh, communicated as 3.10 times 10 to the second degree C, which is, whoops, not degrees C, Kelvin, or 310 Kelvin. But if we just write 310K, we're not really expressing three significant figures that are in the question. And um, let me be somewhat clear about this. When we're doing practice problems, because we're trying to learn some chemical thing, we're trying to learn about moles or ratios or whatever, I don't really care that much that you keep your significant figures perfect all the time. Um, it's more important to me that you get the chemical concept. But when we're actually taking measurements and doing calculations in the lab based on those measurements, that's what this is really for. Right. To make sure that we're actually reporting our measurements with the certainty that we actually took them with and not with more or less certainty. So when you're just working out some problems or doing quizzes or exam problems, I don't care that much. Um, when we're working in the lab is when I really think it's important. Okay, and what would you get for this last one? Negative 4, 5, 2 degrees F. And probably should have written this question a little better, but if we're reporting this with our significant figures properly, what do we call this? Hmm? Uh, well, how many significant figures should we report this number with? Just one, right? Because it's just 4 Kelvin. I probably should have called it 4.00K. Um, in that case, this would just be 500 degrees F, minus 500 degrees F. All right, what time are we going? We're going to talk about density, and then we'll take a little break. Come back, talk about matter, and work out some problems. All right, what, how do you describe density? What is something, what does density mean? Okay, that's like the equation, but yeah. Mass per volume. What does that mean? How would you describe it to somebody who didn't really know what that meant? How compact something is. How compact something is? Yeah. Yeah. What's another way? Is the volume of the space it takes up? Yeah, the space it takes up. Yeah, close. I mean, mass and weight are different quantities because weight um, is a force of gravity acting on mass. But anyway, that's not important. <laughs> it, yeah, it's the mass is the amount of stuff. And volume is the amount of space. So density is really the amount of stuff in a certain amount of space. Mm -hmm. or, or we might say that density is the amount of matter in a given amount of space. And of course the amount of matter is the mass and the given amount of space is the volume. So it's the mass per volume. And the unit that we usually talk about for mass is grams per milliliter. So grams is a measure of mass, milliliter is a measure of volume. So the amount of mass for a certain, uh, a certain volume. So density is important for various reasons. Um, and also, it can allow you to measure things in ways that you didn't really think you, you could, for instance. 
So let's talk about ethylene glycol and water in car ra radiators. Um, I don't know if, if anybody knows this, but there's coolant in your radiator in your car, and it's a mixture of ethylene glycol and water, and other stuff nowadays, of course, too. Uh, but it should be between a certain ratio to be effective. And over time, the ethylene glycol can break down, or sometimes if you get stuck somewhere and you can't get ethylene glycol, you just put water in. And so the density changes. And there's actually a linear density range between ethylene glycol and water. So ethylene glycol has a density of 1.1132 grams per cubic centimeter. And does anybody know what the density of water is? One, about. It slightly changes with temperature, but water is pretty much one gr uh, gram per milliliter. So depending on where your density is in that range, you can actually figure out how much ethylene glycol ver versus how much water you have in your radiator. Does anybody know what the apparatus looks like that does this? You guys check your radiator density much? No. No. OK. Everybody has all new fancy cars now. You don't have to do that. Um, but yeah, there's like a little suction cuppy thing. And you suck it up into this thing with a gauge that has a little needle on it or a little ball floating in it. And depending on where that thing goes, that is dependent on the density. So the more dense it is, uh, the more it will exclude this little thingy and it'll show you that you have less there. So that's an interesting measurement. Um, the other reason that we, the reason that we will mostly use density in the lab is because it allows you to convert between density and volume. Um, and the reason that's so important is when we work with liquids. So let's say you've done your calculations and you need exactly 12 grams of ethylene glycol. Well, you could get out a beaker, you could put it on the thing, and you could pour in your 12 grams and measure it on the balance. But it's probably going to be easier to measure the liquid by volume. Probably easier to put it in a graduated cylinder or use a syringe or something like that. Liquids are much more easily measured by volume than by mass. And if we know the density, we can tell how much of a given amount is in a particular volume. So let's do this with this one. We want 10 milliliters of ethylene glycol, but we want to know how much that actually weighs. How much mass does 10 milliliters of ethylene glycol have? So how do you do that? Yeah, first you have to convert milliliters to cubic centimeters. Does anybody know what that is? What that conversion is? Milliliters to cubic centimeters? It's the same, yeah. One milliliter equals one cubic centimeter, which is also sometimes written like in medicine as a cc. It's the same, measure, same unit. All right, so we've got. 10 milliliters. Are we going to multiply that by the density or divide it by the density? How do you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So we want those milliliters to ultimately cancel out. If we use this conversion from up here, that's 1.1132 grams per one milliliter or cubic centimeter. Milliliters will cancel, and we're left with 11.1 grams. So that's the mass of 10 milliliters of ethylene glycol. The other interesting thing about density is that uh, things that can't mix together, immiscible substances, whether they're liquids or solids, will actually exclude each other based on density. So ice floating, for instance. Is ice more or less dense than water? It's less dense. It has some space in it. So the ice actually floats, and the water will exclude that. Um, if you put 
ice, if you put water and um, some other liquid that it doesn't mix with, like an oil together, the more dense one will go toward the bottom and the less dense one will go toward the top. And you can do that with solids too, so you can actually have different solids kind of floating in different layers um, depending on density. So let's try one more. This is kind of a long, tricky one. So we'll take a little time for you to work on. Liquid nitrogen has a density of 0 0.808 grams per milliliter. Boils at 77K. Researchers, and we'll, we'll have some later this semester, often purchase liquid nitrogen in insulated 175 liter tanks. It's like a big silver thing. Um, and the liquid vaporizes quickly to gaseous nitrogen. And look at the difference in density. So you're going from liquid nitrogen density of 0 0.808 to gas nitrogen density, which is 1.15 grams per liter, not milliliter. So that's like a thousand times the density, which makes sense because air is much, much less dense than liquid. Suppose all the liquid nitrogen accidentally vaporizes in a 10 by 10 by 2.5 meter room. What is the maximum fraction of the air in the room that could be displaced by the gaseous nitrogen? This is actually an important problem that some people have to do sometimes when they talk about where to store nitrogen or where to transport large uh, containers of nitrogen. Because if something catastrophic does happen to that tank and the liquid nitrogen goes into the room, is everyone going to die because they're out of air? Or um, is there still going to be plenty of air left in that room? So see if you can figure this one out. You're going to have to figure out the amount of air in the room, which you get from the volume, and then the amount of nitrogen that is going to ultimately get into the room um, when it goes. So give that a try. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit and I'll, I'm going to go through the whole thing, but how much air is in the room? Wait, what was that? That look about right? About 220 cubic meters? Maybe I'll get that. All right, so that's the volume. Let's see if we can also get that in cubic centimeters, since um, our density here is ultimately going to be in cubic centimeters. So that's mean, that means we're going to, instead of doing 10 by 10 by 2 and a half, it's going to be um, 1,000 by 1,000 by 250, right? So you end up getting 2.50. Wait, how could you get 2? It's got to be 2.50, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it should be 2.50 times 10 to the eighth cubic centimeters. OK, so that's going to be what we're comparing against. That's how much air is in the room. All right. So now let's go talk about the nitrogen. How much nitrogen is there? 175 liters. And is that in the liquid form or in the gas form? So that's in the liquid form, which means it has a density of 0 0.808 grams per milliliter. So now, let's think about the mass equivalents. We're going to talk about laws of conservation of mass in a little bit, but the amount of nitrogen that's in there isn't going to disappear, right? That's what's going to potentially go in the room. But volume doesn't tell us how much is there by itself. We need volume and density so that we can get actually mass, which is how much stuff there is, how much nitrogen there is. So how do we do that? We know there's 175 liquid uh, liters of nitrogen at 0 0.808 grams per milliliter. So let's set up a conversion here. 
175 liters times 1,000 milliliters per one liter that's going to cancel out the liters times 0 0.808 grams per one milliliter so now that cancels liters cancels milliliters and we're left with grams if you do that all you get 141 thousand four hundred grams of nitrogen in that tank. So now starting from there, see if you can do the rest of the problem. Figure out how much volume that would take up using the net if it were now a gas instead of a liquid and then compare that against the volume of the room. Okay, how did you go about this? How did you use this amount of mass of nitrogen with the volume or with the density to figure out the volume of the gas that that would take up? Nobody? Are you just not confident? No idea? All right, let's go through it. So we have 141,400 grams of nitrogen. And we want to know how much volume that takes up. So we're going to use the density as a conversion factor. But this time we're going to use the gas density because we want to know how much space all the gas would take up. So we're going to multiply this by liters on top, grams on the bottom, and this density here tells us that it is 1.15 grams per one liter. Okay, Grams cancel. And we end up with 122,956 liters. So the gaseous nitrogen is taking up that many liters, and we need to compare this against these cubic centimeters. So what should our last step be? Yeah, liters to cubic centimeters. Let's do one more multiplication where we have liters on the bottom and cubic centimeters on the top. How many cubic centimeters in a liter? A thousand, because remember they're the same as a milliliter. So you multiply that by a thousand, you get 1.23 times 10 to the eighth cubic centimeters. And that's the gaseous. liquid nitrogen. Whoops, the, ga the gas nitrogen. Gaseous nitrogen. So, would that displace all the air in the room? No. No. Get about half the air out. Would that make it dangerous? Probably. Still pretty low amount of oxygen in there. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back and do a bunch more problems and talk about some matter. Uh, so let's take 15 minutes, and I'll see you back at 6.50. See, in a normal class, we'd be done, and you just go home, but we got double lecture on every Wednesday, so you're only half done. We come back and talk for another hour and a half. Let's talk a little bit about matter. I, this is probably something you've seen before, but we're going to talk about it in a more uh, stand, uh, standardized language. Right. You got three states of matter. Okay, technically there's some more if you get into the physics and the astronomy and whatever, but we're going to stick with these for now. This is all we'll really have to deal with in the lab. You have solids, liquids, and gases. Everybody heard of those before? 
See, I told you this class was easy. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, now we're going to describe them specifically in terms of volume and shape, because that really is the difference between or among these three uh, classifications. A solid has a fixed volume and shape. A liquid has a fixed volume, but no fixed shape. And a gas or a vapor has neither a fixed volume nor a shape. So think about what that means. Look at the, this, this figure here. A solid makes no difference what sort of container it's in. It won't make the shape of its container. It won't make the volume of its container. It just stays rigid in its solid form with its fixed volume and its fixed shape. A liquid spreads out in its container, so it forms the shape of a container. It has no shape by itself. But it doesn't fill the whole volume of the container. It has its own volume. And then a gas takes the shape of its container and expands to fill the entire volume of the container. So that's sort of the technical difference in those three states. Uh, gases and liquids are both fluids, because they can flow. Um, examples, of course, listed here, gas, the atmosphere, water, gasoline. I'm sure you've all encountered various solids and liquids. And gases are more easily compressed with sol than solids or liquids. You can compress a gas much more easily. And then mostly what we see are mixtures. So we need two different types of mixtures to talk about. We have heterogeneous mixtures. Whoops. We have homogeneous mixtures. which have vis visibly indistinguishable parts. And I'm even going to go a little bit beyond that in a minute. But let's talk about the opposite also, heterogeneous mixtures, which have visibly distinguishable parts. And I would, I would go even deeper than that. I would say a homogeneous mixture, um, it can still be separated, but it looks the same at various levels. And Visibly indistinguishable is kind of a, it's a tough phrase because does visible mean you're just looking at it when it's sitting there? Does that mean you're looking at it under a microscope, under an electron microscope? You know, what does that really mean? Um, let's stick with looks to the naked eye, indistinguishable. So you take um, some various chemicals, you grind them up really, really small, and it basically looks like some gray stuff. That's a heterogeneous, or a homogeneous mixture. You take uh, some rocks and some sand and you put them in a thing of water and there's obviously rocks and sand in the water. That's a heterogeneous mixture, obviously different. Um, homo a special kind of homogeneous mixture is called a solution. And we'll talk about some of those examples. So why don't you give me some examples? Who can think of an example of something that you encounter usually, um, often, that is a homogeneous mixture? Depends on the water. Pure H2O distilled water is a pure substance. It's not a mixture at all. But tap water would be a homogeneous mixture. Some of us, tap water is a heterogeneous mixture. But hopefully, most of us, the tap water is a homogeneous mixture where it just all looks the same throughout, even though we know it has various ions and fluoride and very other things inside it. Anybody else have a homogeneous mixture? Hair? Hair? Air, yes, yes, air. Air is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, we've got nitrogen, oxygen, argon, other gases floating around. Um, but we, it all looks the same to us. Most mixtures of gases seem homogeneous to us. All right, how about some heterogeneous mixtures? Pepper sugar. What? Pepper sugar. Peppers. Oh, yeah, like, like pepper, right? You, you, you look at a pepper shaker, it kind of all looks different colors. Um, but I, you know, if it's really ground finely, pepper can sometimes look homogeneous too. Soup. soup. Depends on the soup, right? 
I mean, a nice consomme or something is, is very homogeneous, but you know, a big stew with big pieces of meat and potatoes is certainly heterogeneous, yeah. yeah. Cereal? Cereal, sure. So you get the idea? I mean, it's a fairly qualitative assessment. It's something we look at and we make a judgment of whether or not that looks the same or not. And we call it heterogeneous or homogeneous. All mixtures do have this particular quality. Mixtures can be separated into pure substance by physical means, not chemical means. That's what separates a pure substance from a mixture. If you take that homogeneous substance, the air, the tap water, the, I don't remember the other ones that we said, um, whatever it was. Soup, yeah, certain soups. Well, I think soup was both. I don't know. Anyway, any of those mixtures, even if you have to get down at the submicroscopic level, you can actually pull those pieces apart. And you can use physical techniques like distillation, evaporation, sublimation, chromatography, filtration, all of these things to actually separate those substances. And we're going to do some of that in the lab um, at some point. Those are all physical means. A pure substance like water can be separated into hydrogen and oxygen, but not by physical means, by chemical means. You have to do a chemical reaction to actually split that thing up. And that's what a pure substance is. It's something with a constant composition that can only really be broken up by chemical means, not physical means. All right, you can read these definitions. Um, so we're going to use some of these terms now and, and talk about what they mean. An element, right, there's your elements. We know what they are. A pure substance of just that that's made of only that type of atom is an element. I mean, it's a pure substance, but it's a pure element. A compound is another type of pure substance that is made up of more than one element. So something like water is a compound, but hydrogen is an element. And here's a handy figure that kind of shows those things, or a little flow chart. So we'll start all the way up at matter. Everything is matter. Matter can either be a pure substance or a mixture. Let's start over on the pure substances side. So it, it doesn't have variable composition. It's the same throughout the whole, the whole batch. So it's a pure substance. Can you separate it at all into simpler substances? If no, then it's a pure element. You can't separate it at all, even through chemical means. Can you separate it through chemical means? Yes, then it's a compound. So, so an element is something like helium, right? Can't, can't turn helium into anything else. Um, but you can take pure water and break it up into hydrogen and oxygen. So water is a compound, uh, helium is an element. We move over to the mixture side. If it's uniform throughout, like some tea with sugar dissolved in it, that's homogeneous. Now it's made up of a bunch of different stuff, and we can you can separate the sugar and this, all that out of tea if you just let it evaporate. Um, but it looks the same throughout, so it's homogeneous. Compare that to their example here is wet sand. Wet sand is a mixture of various rocks and whatever makes up the sand, and then of course water. And you can separate that by simply letting it dry out, right? And, and it's certainly not uniform throughout, so that would be a heterogeneous mixture. Do you have an idea of these terms now? I think you can label things as homogeneous or heterogeneous or so on. OK, great. And now let's look at the difference between a physical and a chemical change. This one is not always uh, so clear, especially if you're just looking at it. The important thing is to look at, is the chemical composition changing or not? So these first two are examples of physical changes. When dry ice sublimes, when it become, goes from dry ice to CO2, that is a physical change. Where it goes from dry ice to gaseous carbon dioxide. It's a physical change. There's no change in the chemical composition. It started as a pure substance, CO2, and it ended as a pure substance, CO2. It just changed its state. Same thing with the problem earlier about the liquid nitrogen. It started as nitrogen. It ended as nitrogen. Nothing changed. Same thing with sugar dissolving. Actually, let's take a little aside there. You guys seen dry ice before? Yeah. What, do, what does it look like? Like a 
wait, wait, wait. Same yeah. So I said, what does it look like? And you said, it's really cool. Yes. <laughs> so that's interesting, because sometimes you know, your measurement is different from what you're actually trying to measure. And that was a good example of that. I was asking for a visual measurement, and you gave me a temperature measurement. That's all right. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a little block, and it is usually kind of foaming, or not foaming, but uh, steaming, right? You see all this stuff coming off. What is that? Is that the sublimation vapor? It's actually not. It's actually not. Um, CO2 is colorless. It's clear. You can't see it. So why is it smoky? What's the smoke? Yeah, it's actually water. The vapor coming off the CO2 is still cold enough to condense water out of the air. So what you see is kind of like clouds, tiny droplets of condensed water that's condensing in the air. And then as it warms back up to this temperature, it becomes water vapor again or falls to the ground. So, so the, the smoke part actually isn't the CO2. It's what you're seeing is the condensing water vapor. OK, and then uh, sugar dissolving, same thing. You put sugar in water. You don't see it anymore. It looks different. It looks like some chemical reaction has occurred. But the sugar is still intact. It actually hasn't broken up. It's still there. It's just uh, very much separated with water molecules in between. So a physical change. And then here's a chemical change, propane gas burning. Anybody ever burned propane gas? A grill or a little stove or something? In that case, you start with something that is, uh, has carbon and hydrogen, propane is a fuel. You add oxygen to it and some energy in the form of a spark. And you form carbon dioxide and water as the byproducts. That's a combustion reaction. And clearly, the propane has changed now. It's not the same thing anymore. It's not propane at all. It's carbon dioxide and water. So that would be an example of a chemical change. All right.